Funding for the VDRDC and this webinar was provided by the U.S. Department of Education under grant number H327J110005. However, the contents of this webinar do not necessarily represent the policy of the U.S. Department of Education, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government. Hello, I'm Jim Stovall, founder and president of the Narrative Television Network, and I want to welcome all of you to this very first webinar presented by the Video Description Research and Development Center, VDRDC. And VDRDC is a project of Smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute and the U.S. Department of Education. And when Josh Mealy from Smith Kettlewell called me and asked me to be a part of this, I was really excited because for many, many years, Smith Kettlewell has been a leader in breakthrough research that benefits blind and visually impaired people and how they live their lives. And Josh told me about the Description Leadership Network, DLN, and asked me to be the chairman of it. And I was really excited about that as well because the DLN brings together some of the best people in the description effort and movement on the cutting edge of how we deliver accessible programming to blind and visually impaired people, teachers, students, and everybody throughout the community. So I'm really excited about it. You know, when I think about description, of course, I think about it as someone that's dedicated my professional life to this for almost a quarter of a century, but I also think about it from the aspect as a consumer, because for half of my life, I've lived as a blind person. And I remember, as if it were today, that morning I woke up those 25 years ago, and I was instantly confronted with the reality that I had lost the remainder of my sight, and I knew right then I would live the rest of my life as a blind person. And the thoughts and doubts and fears that came over me that morning those years ago would be almost impossible to describe to you. And as I kind of mustered myself and collected my thoughts, I, I immediately brought to mind three things that I thought I would not be able to do again as I had done as a sighted person. First was mobility issues, getting around on my own. Second was the ability to read newspapers, magazines, and books. And third was TV, movies, educational videos, those sorts of things. Well, as I developed my life as a blind person, I instantly realized that uh, there are many mobility techniques available for uh, blind people to get around. You know, there are mobility instructors and all those things. And I got a letter the other day from a major airline telling me that I've now flown over two million miles with them. So uh, getting around is not a problem. In fact, I'd like to spend more time at my home. So the mobility issue was resolved and can be resolved for blind and visually impaired people. Then I thought about, you know, the books and the newspapers and all the printed material. Well, when I was a sighted person, I thought I was uh, headed for an NFL contract, so I'm embarrassed to say I didn't study as I should have as a student, and I hadn't read a lot of books. And uh, But once I lost my sight as a blind person, I discovered all of the recorded material that's available for blind people and the new digital technology and the way to speed it up, and now... As a totally blind person, and thanks to high-speed players, I consume a book almost every day. So, you know, that problem was resolved. And then there was the third and final problem of movies, television, educational videos, and those sorts of things. And that wasn't so easy 25 years ago. But now through the art and science of description, we're making breakthroughs there that I think will affect blind and visually impaired people, teachers, students, people all around the world. Because in this ever more... Uh, digital technology age, it's more important than ever that blind and visually impaired students have access to video material and educational material that's delivered via television and via the web and DVD and all of that. And through this VDRDC, there are going to be many exciting breakthroughs in the technology as to how that is de delivered. And right now, I want you to hear from a colleague of mine from the American Council of the Blind. He'll tell you more about description, what it is, and how it works. Here's Joel Schneider. Good afternoon, all. This is Joel Schneider. And first, I want to thank Josh Mealy and Smith Kettlewell for their work to date on the Video Description Research and Development Center, and in particular on this seminar. The center is a relatively new initiative, but it's already making an impact. So, bravo! And while the focus, of course, is on description for video, my belief is that once quality description becomes more widely available in media, we will gain far more visibility, you should forgive the expression, and then uh, make great strides 
in making other areas of our culture more accessible to people who are blind or have low vision. I'm speaking of cinema, museums, performing arts, and other events, in addition to television and recorded or or streamed video. I describe audio description as a literary art form. I'm stretching my arms out wide. No, no, no. Let me rephrase that. It's um, it's a type of poetry. I'm bringing my hands in closer to each other. Actually, it's somewhat akin to a haiku. My hands are almost touching. I say a haiku because we must use as few words as possible to provide a verbal version of the visual. The visual is made verbal and oral, A-U-R-A-L, I'm pointing to my ears, and oral, O-R-A-L, I'm gesturing to my mouth. We use words that are succinct, vivid, and imaginative to convey that visual image, not accessible, not fully accessible to a segment of the population. New estimates, by the way, by um, the American Foundation for the Blind now put that number at over 25 million Americans alone who are blind or have difficulty seeing even with correction. But then description is also valuable when the visual image is not fully re- realized by, by the rest of us, sighted folks who see but who may not observe. I often say that uh, the use of audio description goes back to prehistoric times. Two sighted cavemen were munching on some leftover saber-toothed tiger when one fellow screamed to the other, Look out behind you, Og! There's a mastodon coming from the left! There you have it. Ladies and gentlemen, right there, the origin of audio description. And Og had 20-20 vision. He was simply looking the wrong way. Well, since then, we've learned that description is, of course, extremely valuable for people who are blind or have low vision, but also for someone who's in the kitchen making a sandwich while the TV is on in the living room. He or she doesn't miss a beat. A bit of history for you. Uh, Audio description was first developed in the United States. It was the subject of a master's thesis in San Francisco, California in the uh, 1970s by the late Gregory Fraser. Mr. Fraser was the first to work out the concepts behind the act and the art of audio description. And in 1980, a theater in Washington, D.C., Arena Stage, assembled a group of people to provide advice on accessibility issues. Among the committee members were Chet Avery, a Department of Education employee who worked with the funding of captioning uh, a blind man, and Dr. Margaret Fanshteel, then Dr. Margaret Rockwell. Dr. Fanshteel, a blind woman, founded the Metropolitan Washington Ear, a closed-circuit radio reading service for people who are blind or for those who don't otherwise have access to print. Well, from there, the Washington Ear's audio description program was developed, and uh, I'm proud to have been a part of that first group at the EAR, the world's first ongoing audio description service. Now, um, early on, actually in the 1970s, Japanese broadcasters experimented with description for television programming. But in 1985, WGBH in Boston came to the EAR to collaborate on a pilot of television description for the PBS American Playhouse series. PBS remains the leader in offering description for a range of programs. Uh, For five years, I produced description for the network's mainstay, Sesame Street. Other broadcasters began to offer some description in the 1990s and at the start of the new millennium. Indeed, it, it was in 2002 that the FCC issued an order mandating description at a minimal level but the order was vacated following a successful challenge in the courts. Opponents maintained that the FCC had gone beyond its authority by enacting a mandate without specific direction from Congress. Well, that led to a a decade of hard work by many proponents of description, and finally, the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, signed by President Obama in October 2010. And speaking of the president, 
Uh, there, there's uh, his uh, photo uh, in the PowerPoint of him signing the act. I can also report that the president himself knows about audio description and is supportive. And here's another photo for you. There he is shaking hands with a describer at the White House, where I was helping to make a ceremony accessible to citizens there who are blind or have low vision. So, beginning in July of this year, a mandate for description on television goes into effect. Initially, it requires the top four terrestrial broadcasters, that's NBC, ABC, CBS, and Fox, and the top five cable programmers, USA, TBS, TNT, Disney, and Nick at Night, all of them to include description with at least four hours of programming each week in the top 25 markets. I should also mention a bit about the transmission process. Many of you may know, in this country, before June of 2009, description for television was accessible via a special audio channel available on stereo televisions. Viewers would select the SAP, Secondary Audio Program Channel, in order to hear the regular program audio accompanied by descriptions, precisely timed to occur principally during the lapses between dialogue and significant sound elements. Unfortunately, on the one SAP channel available, a viewer might access Spanish translation as often as one would hear description. Well, now in the era of digital transmission, uh, there is the technical facility to offer two or more secondary audio streams. This is one item that the FCC is wrestling with and a topic of great discussion among the members of the FCC's Video Programming Access Advisory Committee. It's a panel on which I serve. And and we're also striving to create uniform standards for the transmission and reception of the description audio. So that, very briefly, is the broadcast story, since we're focused on video description here. There's still much to be done in other video formats. The percentage of all Uh, Video and film that incorporates description is still minuscule. DVDs are an ideal format for description because the audio track can be turned on or off as desired and an audio menu can be programmed. Well, given that fact, it's um, quite unfortunate that there are still so few DVDs produced with description in the United States. And keep in mind that we're a country of some 320 million and we have access to maybe 150 commercial DVDs with description. In the UK, with a population of only about 60 million, they're fortunate to have at least 500 DVDs available with description. And only a a handful of DVDs anywhere include an audio menu, making their navigation accessible. So we have plenty to do with respect to description and video, and that's why Smith Kettlewell's work with the Video Description Research and Development Center is really quite critical. Finally, let me, um, I want to note one area that I believe is ripe for description research. We all know, and it's been demonstrated in various studies, that captions have a positive effect for children learning English. Well, not too long ago, I conducted a workshop at the Connecticut Children's Museum in New Haven with daycare workers and reading teachers on what I think represents a new application for audio description, literacy. We, we experimented with developing more descriptive language to use when working with kids and picture books or videos. It's not surprising that uh, uh, those picture books, those videos, rely on images to tell the story. But you know, a teacher or a family member trained in audio description techniques would never simply hold up a picture of a red ball and read the text, See the Ball. There's the red ball for you on on the screen. No, I think a teacher with description in mind would, would add, the ball is red, just like a fire engine. I think that ball is as large as one of you. It's as round as the sun, a bright red circle or sphere. Now, what's happened? The teacher has introduced new vocabulary, invited comparisons, and used metaphor or simile with toddlers. So by using audio description, books, videos are made accessible to children who have low vision or are blind, and 
I think you help develop more sophisticated language skills for all kids. A picture is worth a thousand words, we've all heard that. Well, maybe. But an audio describer might say that a few well-chosen words can conjure vivid and lasting images. In closing, I want to emphasize one point. There, there really is no reason why a person with a visual disability must also be culturally disadvantaged. You know, in the United States, the principal constituency for audio description has an unemployment rate of about 70 percent. Well, I'm certain that with more meaningful access to our culture and its resources, people become more informed, more engaged with society, and more engaging individuals, thus more employable and essential to the development of artists who are blind or have low vision. Audio description makes those artworks accessible to them, uh, to those budding uh, artists who happen to be blind or have low vision. Thank you for, for listening, and I invite you to be in touch if you have any questions or would like additional information. My contact information is on the slide being shown now. I also want to quickly mention that uh, one of my contracts is with the American Council of the Blind. I direct its audio description project. I encourage you to visit our website at www.acb.org slash ADP. We're currently working on user-focused guidelines for the production of audio description and a certification process for audio describers. We provide recognition for leading efforts in description, and we have a great program that invites uh, kids who are blind or have low vision to write reviews of described films, videos, or television programs. And we give awards to the top young described film critics. And this July, you can get involved with our next Audio Description Project conference, followed by a three-day training intensive. That's this July in Louisville, Kentucky, in conjunction with the annual conference and convention of the American Council of the Blind. Thanks for joining us. Hi, this is Jason Stark, Project Director of the Described and Captioned Media Program, DCMP. We've all just been provided an overview of description. Now, I'd like to play two audio clips taken from the title, The Great Whales, produced by New Dimension Media and available from the DCMP Library. These clips will be audio only, which will simulate the experience a student who is blind or visually impaired would have in the classroom. Here's the clip presented without description. Here, isolated from distant shores, but surrounded by protective reefs, lies a place called the Silver Bank, the winter refuge of the humpback whale. Of all the great whales, these may be the most graceful. Now, here is the same clip presented with description. Here, isolated from distant shores, but surrounded by protective reefs, lies a place called the Silver Bank, the winter refuge of the humpback whale. The humpback has a stocky body and, as its name implies, humps along its back. Along its head and lower jaw are white, knobby bumps. The grooves along its underside are fewer in number but more distinct, and its tail is long, sometimes up to a third of its body length. Of all the great whales, these may be the most graceful. This is a clear example of how critical educational video description is for the equal access of students who are blind or visually impaired. Now that we all know what description is, and what it sounds like, I'd like to spend some time talking about teacher and parent sources for educational described media and additional information about its use in the classroom. Next slide. The DCMP is funded by the U.S. Department of Education and is administered by the National Association of the Deaf. The DCMP provides free accessible media services to benefit students with hearing or vision impairments who are early learners or in kindergarten through grade 12 classrooms. One of our tasks is to determine specific curricular needs for accessible media in the nation's schools. 
As most participants in the webinar audience know, students with a sensory impairment do not have equal access to educational media. Next slide. This is illustrated by the 2008 DCMP survey of 35 top educational media producers and distributors in the U.S. Of the 30,122 total media items identified for sale by these companies, only 7,761, or 26 percent, were captioned, and an even lower number of 1,091 items, 3.6 percent, were described. Out of the 35 companies, 26 knew what description was, but only 8 offered described media for sale. Companies have repeatedly told us that they offer few products with description because schools and teachers don't demand it. One message for today's webinar participants is that you should be a, quote, squeaky wheel, unquote. Tell companies that you need description. Because there is no federal mandate to use description in the classroom, companies are not inclined to go to the trouble or expense unless they hear from their consumers. A resource we are offering to all webinar viewers is a list of the limited number of educational media producers and distributors who do sell educational media with description. This list and other resources covered during today's webinar have been compiled on one web page and we'll share the URL at the end of the session. Next slide. The following year, in 2009, the DCMP surveyed teachers of the visually impaired, TVIs, in an attempt to measure their awareness of the availability of described educational video-based media and to uncover classroom trends concerning overall video usage. The results are as follows. 67% of TVIs in residential schools and 34% of TVIs in public schools use video. 87% describe the videos themselves or ask an aide or student to do it for them. 81% of TVIs not using video would do so if it had description. So, the need and the interest is well documented. Next slide. If you are someone who would like more information about that need, a resource available to teachers, parents, and teacher training personnel is the DCMP production entitled Equal Access in the Classroom. Available free both online and in DVD format, it provides examples of description and captioning, provides teacher testimony supporting the need for those accessibility options in educational media, and reviews the services provided by the DCMP, including the Free Loan Library of Accessible Media. Next slide. The DCMP is your free source of described educational media. If you are a teacher or a parent of a child who is blind or visually impaired, school administrator, or other qualified individual. There are no fees for DCMP membership or program use. Over 4,000 accessible educational media items are available for early learners and those students in kindergarten through grade 12 plus. All of these titles have captioning and many have description. Also, a selection of the titles have Spanish narration and captioning. And beginning this year, the DCMP is also providing titles with Spanish description. DCMP titles are available instantly online or mailed to members in DVD format. Next slide. Features of the DCMP media collection are unique. All media is selected after the DCMP conducts research of national curricular priorities and solicits user input. And then that media is formally evaluated by teachers. Titles include high quality accessibility features which have been proofed and edited for accuracy and adherence to program standards. In addition, DVD titles with description include talking menus. A user-friendly online catalog allows DCMP members to browse by topic or perform keyword search. And that's not all. Lesson guides are available for a large number of titles, a new feature of which will be the inclusion of caption and description scripts, allowing teachers, parents, and other members to pre-teach vocabulary and concepts. Next slide. There are some other sources for described educational programming. These include, first, network and cable TV educational programs which are described through the United States Department of Education grants. This described educational program can be found on many networks such as PBS, CNN, Disney, ABC, and Nick Jr. Second, Discovery Streaming, a subscription-based streamed educational media service reaching 65% of the nation's schools, has a selection of described titles which can be identified through a search within their service. 
Third, many movies and general interest television programs have educational and cultural enrichment value, and the Perkins School for the Blind, the Audio Description Project of ACB, and WGBH all have information regarding productions and programs with description. Fourth, online sources such as iTunes and YouTube also have titles with description. However, the DCMP does remain as your primary source of educational content, as well as information and advocacy services. As we hope you have already learned today, we have much information related to the educational benefits of description and how to use it in the classroom, but we also provide information about how to create it. Next slide. In respect to description creation, we have one-of-a-kind guidelines and standards compiled into an internet training tool named the Description Key. This resource covers a range of topics from preparing to describe to determining both what information needs to be described as well as how to describe it. Developed in partnership with the American Foundation for the Blind in 2008, it will be useful to those of you who are describing media for your students and also to those advocating for its use. As a supplement to the description key, the DCMP is currently partnering with ACB in the development of great appropriate vocabulary words to be used in description with a concentration on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math content. Next slide. We want to recruit you as DCMP advocacy partners, imparting the message that access is good for everyone. Each March, the DCMP conducts a national campaign called Listening is Learning in partnership with ACB. Description is, of course, critically needed by students who are blind or visually impaired, but it can also improve learning opportunities for everyone. As many students who are blind or visually impaired are in the public schools, the important message that description can also benefit sighted students will help to enlist support for access from teachers in that setting. We invite you to visit the Listening is Learning website to learn more and to join our campaign this March. Next slide. I would now like to turn things over to Emily Bell of CaptionMax, who will discuss some tips for using described educational media in the classroom. Hi, I'm Emily Bell with CaptionMax, and I've created a bunch of described media for classroom use over the last several years. We've gotten some great feedback from the teachers who've used these videos. So beyond what you already know about effectively using video in general as part of your lessons, here are a few tips for getting the most out of described programs. Slide 2. Six Tips. I'm sure you're aware that the best practice for all classroom video is for the instructor to watch it first, and that is, of course, important here too. Many of the videos that are appropriate for the classroom have some sort of lesson guide or instructional goals to go along with them, especially if you get the video from the DCMP, and I don't need to tell you that reading these is definitely helpful. Whenever possible, a video describer pays attention to these guides and the curriculum correlations when creating description for educational media, but that can be somewhat far removed from your specific objectives in your specific classroom. You know your lesson plan, and you know your students best. After watching the video yourself, you might feel the need to add additional description to a part of the lesson plan that you are focusing on, or maybe supplement certain descriptions for a particular student who could use more help. Which leads to point two. The more description you listen to, the better you will get at doing it yourself. You'll internalize the conventions that describers use, and then it will be easier and more effective if you want to provide your own descriptions to classroom media, whether supplementing existing description or fixing an inaccessible video. As you just heard, there's more and more description on television these days, so turn it on once in a while. There are going to be future webinars about describing things yourself. Third, it's important to know that a video is described and to set that up for the students in advance. In addition to providing the class with background information, objectives, or an outline about the topic of the video, give them a brief definition of what video description is, because it's confusing when there's all of a sudden a second narrator talking. This is really important for the students who will be using the description so they can be prepared to focus part of their attention on it, which is a skill developed through repetition. We've also had some comments from people who are not blind or visually impaired who didn't understand what the description was and felt like they were being talked down to and freaked out a little. And while that could be a good personal growth experience for them, to reduce agitation all around, it's best to just tell people that this video is described and this is what that's for. Next slide, tip four. It's a good idea to watch an entire program rather than just a short clip. This goes counter to the individual learning module concept, but because description is inserted where it fits best, the same visual elements aren't necessarily re-described in every part of a program. So if it's a long show like a documentary, 
Description users are going to get the most out of it if the program is treated as a whole, which can also help students better integrate the visual cues they may miss or misinterpret. However, don't let that stop you from going back and watching important parts of the video multiple times or enabling students to repeat sections on their own. That's the best of both worlds. Number five, and this is a biggie, how will this video be watched? If students are assigned to watch it individually, be sure that students who will need it know how to access the description and that the controls to do that are usable for them, whether that's a DVD with talking menu buttons or a streaming interface with screen reader accessible control buttons. Also make sure they can use the pause and rewind controls. That's really helpful to go back and listen again if you miss a description. If the students are broken up into small groups, turn the description on for them so the students who need it don't have to negotiate with the other kids, because that's not really fair. If it's the whole class watching, turn the description on, including all students in the exciting experience of watching TV and in participating in discussion is the whole point. Remember that DVD and web videos are easy to pause and rewind, so you can take a quick break for questions or to encourage students to predict outcomes or to replay a section at a student's request or if someone looks confused. If there are supplemental learning materials that you'll be using for students, such as quizzes or informational graphics or the final exam, you'll need to make sure those are accessible as well. That's a whole different webinar, but many of the same organizations that you're hearing from today are a good starting point for that. Last tip. As a teacher, you're undoubtedly going to assess student comprehension in some way after you show a video, whether that's an actual test or a more freeform discussion. Now, I know you're busy, but the members of the DLN would love your feedback. The website is on the next slide. Were students who use the description more engaged in class discussion than they usually are? Did they indicate a better understanding of the material? Along the lines of how closed captions are being used for literacy and language learning, did any of the students without visual impairments use the description or, by your measurements, benefit from it? We get really excited about anecdotes because they give us all ideas for improvement and research. So thanks for your time. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Joshua Mealy, director of the VDRDC, who will be giving you sneak peeks at VDRDC Technologies. Hi, my name is Josh Mealy. I am the director of the Video Description Research and Development Center at Smith Kettlewell in San Francisco. It is truly a pleasure to be here today uh, with this wonderful team telling you about all sorts of new and exciting things in video description and how to get resources, but also to give you a sneak peek at some of the technologies that we're developing at Smith Kettlewell. And I'm going to give you the list of them as they're shown on the screen now, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each one. We only have a couple of minutes, so I'm not going to be able to go into too much detail, but I hope that you will be as excited as I am about some of the possibilities that we're exploring here at, at the VDRDC. Shown on the screen is a list of four items. It's the Descriptive Video Exchange, or DVX, Automated Algorithmic Description, or AAD, choreographed and orchestrated video annotation, which we call COVA, C-O-V-A, and finally, remote real-time description, or RRTD. I'll tell you a little bit more about each of these. This slide talks more about the descriptive video exchange, or DVX. Like other tools, DVX allows a sighted viewer to view and record descriptions of a video, such as a DVD or stream. Unlike currently available systems, this actually saves the uh, descriptive clips onto a server on the internet where they can be shared. And the video material remains on the DVD or stream where it was originally. This means that anybody anywhere can record descriptions and have them viewable by anybody anywhere else without modifying or redistributing anybody's video material. In other words, this is kind of like a wiki for video description. It allows people to watch videos, add annotations and descriptions without modifying the original video, and then when somebody else, somewhere else, puts the DVD into their player and watches it, the descriptions can be resynchronized at playback time as they're downloaded off of the internet without the need for that DVD to be a described version. We see this as a very powerful approach for creating what we call crowdsourced video descriptions so that volunteers, teachers, parents, etc. have the power to record descriptions for any given video and then anybody anywhere else who's using the DVX system has the power to listen to those descriptions 
simply by playing that same video, either by renting the DVD themselves or by uh, watching that same feed from someplace like YouTube or Netflix. It's an extremely cool uh, and very exciting uh, possibility. You can learn more about this by going to our website, http colon slash slash www.vdrdc.org slash technology slash dvx. This next slide gives some examples of why dvx is so cool. The crowdsourcing thing is really at the top of the list. It is a new type of technology and a new way of providing description that has never been available before. And the ability for anybody anywhere to do that description and be able to share that with anybody anywhere else is really going to be a game changer. Um, in addition, the software will run on a PC or it could also run on a mobile handheld. So that could be for recording and playback. The uh, DVX server stores all of the descriptive clips online, so really there's no need to um, tie those tightly to a particular title. That means that it's really easy to get described material because all you need to get is the standard version, and if there's a description available, you can download it and synchronize it in real time. We're also really excited about the possibilities of using social network technologies and techniques to not only recruit, but also to rate different describers, to almost turn it into uh, a game um, so that describers will compete with each other to create the best descriptions. And that's, um, that's just an example of uh, some of the really amazing possibilities that DVX presents. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Automated Algorithmic Description Project, or AAD, which uses existing machine vision techniques to automate some specific aspects of description. I'll tell you a little bit more about that on my next slide, but if you want to learn more about this project, you can, of course, go to our website, http colon slash slash www.vdrdc.org slash technology slash AAD. My next slide provides some concrete examples about the types of things that can be done with Automated Algorithmic Description, or AAD. We think we can use computer algorithms to automatically analyze when scenes change and possibly even to say what this new scene is. And of course, that information can be presented as an audio cue or could be presented on a braille display. Um, so another possibility is when on-screen text is shown, we can use uh, computer techniques to analyze that text and figure out what it says, and again, present that with speech or on a Braille display. One of the other things that AAD can do for us is to um, recognize faces. When a particular actor or character is on screen, we can actually present the name of that character as a speech cue or on a Braille display. These are just a couple of the areas of active research, and we think that there are quite a few other possibilities um, open to us with AAD. My next slide discusses the Choreographed and Orchestrated Video Annotation Project, or COVA, C-O-V-A. This provides synchronized audio description of video on a personal device, such as a cell phone or handheld, without requiring the TV or movie theater to provide description itself. And I'll explain more about how we're planning to do that, but if you want to learn more about this project, you can go to http colon slash slash www.vdrdc.org slash technology slash c-o-v-a. My next slide talks about some concrete examples of what COVA will be able to do and, and how it will be useful. The basic idea is to use a smartphone to access descriptive clips that might be stored on the DVX server or some other remote location. So the description clips are what's coming to the user over the smartphone. The video is being played from somewhere else, like a projector or a television or in a movie theater. The synchronization happens by listening to the soundtrack of the video, and the phone then sends the information about the soundtrack to a server, gets synchronization and identification information, and is able to synchronize the playback of the descriptions that way. This is very similar to things that are already being done uh, with services like Shazam and SoundHound. 
The really powerful uh, thing that this provides is that no special hardware or software needs to be present to support description on the playback device. And what I mean by playback is, you know, the TV or projector or the DVD player. All of the description handling is done on the individual's smartphone or mobile device. One of the cool things about this is that it provides individual control for each of the consumers. That means that they can uh, turn it on and off as they need description or they can replay descriptions as necessary. It provides uh, real flexibility at the user level. We believe this will probably be uh, quite useful not only in theaters, but of course in uh, school assemblies and other situations uh, such as in the classroom and places where description facilities may not be otherwise available. My next slide introduces the Remote Real-Time Description or RRTD project. The idea here is to allow blind and visually impaired smartphone users to connect with sighted describers so that information about real-time events can be streamed to them over the internet. You can learn more about this project at our website, www.vdrdc.org slash technology slash RRTD. I'm going to wrap up my overview of this technology portion just by talking about some concrete examples of how remote real-time description can be of uh, benefit. We think that it'll be useful in live performances, but also in uh, describing webinars and video conferences, and even things like uh, virtual environments like Second Life. It's going to leverage an existing technology, voice over IP, which is already in widespread use in uh, situations uh, technologies like Skype, uh, which a lot of people use. This will allow the um, describer to be someplace completely different from the person that's requiring the description and also opens up the possibility for many people to listen to one description stream, sort of similar to a broadcast or conference call, but uh, it'll be used for describing a real-time event. We're planning uh, two focus groups this year and two more next year. The two focus groups that we're planning this year will be at um, two major conventions of uh, blind folks that are both happening this summer. One of them is at the American Council of the Blind Convention. They're going to be meeting in Louisville, Kentucky this year from uh, July 6th to the 14th and we're going to be running a, a focus group that will um, discuss the technologies that we're developing and some of the other things that the VDRDC is doing. The National Federation of the Blind also has a national convention, of course, and theirs is going to be in Dallas, Texas this year, and that's um, from June 30th to uh, July 5th. And it would be absolutely wonderful if some of the people that are uh, attending this webinar could also attend our focus groups. We would love to get feedback and information from you about the types of technologies that you need and the types of thoughts you have about what we're doing. If you want to get more information about attending those focus groups, you can send an email to info at vdrdc.org. You can, of course, send an email to that address for uh, more information about any of the things I've talked about today. I'd like to conclude this segment simply by thanking uh, the members of the Description Leadership Network, many of whom have made today's presentation possible. These organizations include the American Council of the Blind, the American Foundation for the Blind, CaptionMax, the Described and Captioned Media Program, who is hosting today's broadcast, DeCapta, the Ideal Group, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Narrative Television Network, and the National Federation of the Blind. We thank them all. I would also like to thank you for attending and very much appreciate your interest in this topic. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Kyle Sisk from the Described and Captioned Media Program. We'll now open the floor for questions. Uh, we will accept questions via text chat. If you're on a PC, the F8 key will take you directly to the text chat window. You can also submit your question by email to webinars at dcmp.org. I'll read the questions aloud, then Jim Stovall will direct the question to the appropriate presenter. Okay, to, uh, to start off, we've had uh, several questions about recording and uh, archiving the webinar today. Uh, it is being recorded, and we're going to send a link um, in several different flavors. Uh, one will be 
uh, the webinar platform itself. Another will be a video version with captions. Uh, and we'll send that link um, sometime this week, hopefully. Uh, so you all get that. And uh, I'll give a few minutes here for uh, the questions to come in, and we'll, uh, we'll start taking a few. Okay, we've got one question from Mary Ann Siller. Uh, what was the name of the school program Joel was supporting with description and uh, educational materials? Hi, Mary Ann. It's Joel. Um, I think you're referring to the Connecticut Children's Museum where I did a, I developed an audio described tour of their museum but uh, they also have a school uh, there um, under the uh, able leadership of Sandy Malmquist. Uh, and Marianne, if you send me a note, I'd be happy to get um, her contact information to you. One other question from uh, Olivia Chavez. Um, which movie theaters have described movies? This is Jim Stovall, and I'd like to uh, thank you for that question. And uh, I think uh, Joel Schneider could probably speak to that. It's a tough one. Um, first, I would I would have you go to the website of the Audio Description Project. That's acb.org slash a d as in dog, p as in Peter. There is a section there on description for movies. Um, but moreover, I would also ask you to um, visit wgbh.org and uh, check their accessibility links. I don't have the correct URL in front of me, but uh, by far uh, the bulk of movies that are described are produced, the description is produced by WGBH, and they have a more comprehensive list of what movies um, are described uh, for first run movies in movie theaters and what theaters are equipped to show them. We have uh, another question from Katie uh, I will not attempt that last name. <laughs> um, I just want to confirm that I have this correct. The RRTD will upload to the DVX and then be channeled out to the B slash VI person's smartphone. Would the real-time describer be able to use a smartphone, too? It's a great question, and I'm going to ask Josh Mealy if he could step in on that. First, I have to do a mic check. I'm having a technical problem with my microphone. Can you guys hear me? I hear you. It's working. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that question. So, um, it's I realize that it's confusing in a slight uh, alphabet soup of of uh, projects that I've thrown at you. The the RRTD or Remote Real Time Description is actually intended to be. Um, uh, more of a, as, it, as its name implies, it's a real-time uh, option and is not necessarily intended to be um, uh, to be uploaded and saved. It's something that that could be used for um, for live performances or other live real-time events like webinars. I think, um, on the other hand, what you're what you may be asking about is the DVX and the ability to upload your own descriptions that um, would then be synchronized with. Um, with uh, streamed or uh, or video on a DVD, and yes, indeed, uh, the plan is to be able to use um, a number of different platforms for that. We're um, we're starting out with a PC platform, but um, the the idea is to be able to use uh, smartphones or other mobile devices to be able to both view and uh, and upload descriptions. So um, for, for both the, the blind and visually impaired viewer for um, watching and watching video and, and listening to description, as well as for those who want to um, annotate and add descriptions to streamed uh, media, mobile devices would definitely be, um, uh, be an option. Another question, um, this one comes in by email from Jacqueline Packer. Once the new law is in effect for TV, how will we get shows um, to announce that they're described. TV Guide, et cetera, needs to indicate this. 
um, anything we can do as a group? It's a great question from uh, Jackie Packer. I know that uh, NarrativeTV.com will be um, having an ongoing site there that will tell Could you uh, repeat that? We had a little bit of a technical problem with the room. Seems like uh, Jim's mic might be uh, having some problems. Uh, read that again, and let uh, one of the other moderators uh, answer that one. That was from Jackie Packer or Jacqueline Packer. Uh, what's the new laws in effect for television? How will we get shows uh, announcements for shows that they are described? TV Guide, etc. Uh, needs to indicate this. Is there anything we can do as a group? Well, um, hi, Jackie. A great question, of course. And I think Jim's, um, uh, what he started to answer, going to his website, he will, um, uh, he's uh, planning on having um, uh, a, a listing, a schedule of programs that have description. But much beyond that, um, I can tell you that the FCC is specifically, the committee I sit on is specifically working on uh, how to uh, connect with the two major distributors of television information so that every program that has description, has a symbol, has a way of indicating it in print and orally, um, and also ways to indicate that a program has description when you have um, it on, that there's a tone, whatever that may uh, happen before a program. Um, accessing description in the digital age has been a work in progress. Uh, in my humble opinion, it should have been worked out before we went to the digital age. So we're a couple years late, but the FCC's got this committee going. Hopefully we'll have a lot of uh, information about this by July when the mandate goes into place. Thank you, Joel. Um, our next question is from Peg Hartman. This is the first of four webinars. Uh, what are the topics of the other three? Uh, Josh, I'll just go ahead and let you uh, address that. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the first of four webinars. We're going to be doing uh, one per semester for the remainder of the, uh, the project period. And um, the uh, future topics have not yet been formally announced, but they will include um, uh, a more uh, detailed overview of um, the kinds of technologies that we're developing here at Smith Kettlewell. That's going to be um, a little further in the future. Um, probably the next webinar will focus on actually using some of the um, audio description tools that, that you can download and use yourself to add your own descriptions to video materials. So if you're a teacher and you have a, um, a video that you want to show in your classroom but it is not available as a described source, we would like to um, provide some training in how to add that uh, description yourself. Um, uh, there will be some other topics probably also related to um, the, uh, the art and technique of description as well as some of the, um, some of the existing guidelines and, um, and tools such as the description key on how to go about crafting your own description. So um, a bunch of topics that will hopefully be of use for teachers uh, on, you know, in the classroom, really providing, um, providing access to the information that they're trying to teach with. We've got a, another question for Josh. Um, how will DVX be managed and edited, especially if someone is too wordy? Again, a great question. And um, the, uh, the VDRDC has the words research and development in its name. And um, these tools are, um, we not only need to develop the technologies, we need to develop the techniques that, um, that will be applied to using them. So that's a, it's a really great question, and it's obviously um, a very important one. We're interested in a number of possible ways of optimizing or improving voluntarily contributed content. For example, if somebody um, has a description that goes too long and steps on dialogue. There are a couple of different approaches technologically uh, that we can apply to that. One would be to simply use speech compression to speed up the description without, um, without changing the pitch, of course, so that it could fit into the available space. Another technique would be simply to pause the video for the duration of the description and then resume playback automatically at the conclusion of the description. Uh, another 
approach to this, of course, is user ratings or listener ratings. When somebody hears a descriptive clip that they think is unhelpful or um, poorly crafted, they can actually rate that description on a clip-by-clip -clip basis. Um, so they can um, say with a very with just a keystroke, this description was unhelpful, um, and we can use those user ratings to um, to prioritize different types of description. If 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 there's a particular description that uh, has a very low rating, we might simply elect not to play it. Um, and uh, finally, just like a wiki is a uh, a forum where everybody can edit the uh, the content and it will sort of tend towards a um, uh, a group um, a consensus view of what the uh, what the right answer is. We're interested in using collaborative approaches to description, so that if you listen to a, a set of descriptive clips or a, a movie description, and there's one clip that you don't like, you might uh, just delete that clip and re-record it yourself and um, see if that's uh, that that might lead to an improved uh, an improved approach. These, all of these things that I've just mentioned um, have a lot of detail to them. So sort of glossing over them um, may, uh, may sound like they are sort of um, pie in the sky ideas, but actually each of these ideas has, um, has a, very, a very solid approach to how it would be implemented. And I think there are a number of other um, answers to that question as well. But, um, but basically we are looking for, um, we're looking for ways of making voluntarily contributed descriptive information usable uh, by by consumers. We realize that it will not be the quality of the professional um, of professional description, but we think that it will still be useful. This is uh, Jason Stark with the DCMP again. I um, apologize, we've uh, had lots of good questions today, but we're running out of time. I uh, do want to let everyone know that um, our plan is to post um, all of the questions and their answers, including those that uh, haven't been able to be answered live, um, along with um, a archive version of the webinar. Um, as, as Kyle mentioned earlier, we've had uh, several requests for um, access to the PowerPoint and, and um, archival information. Uh, we will be listing all uh, web URLs um, referred to in uh, the presentation on a page that's going to be available at webinars.dcmp.org forward slash resources. And we're going to put that up uh, on the, the presentation here. Um, also, if any of you joined the webinar without completing the formal registration process, we'd love to know who you are. Um, might be that you got the information from a, a friend or colleague. Um, if you could send a quick email to webinars at dcmp.org with your name, organization, and job title, um, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, finally, we will be sending each registered participant um, an email with a link to a brief survey. Um, it's really important that we get the survey back from each of you. Um, if you enjoyed and learned from today's webinar, we'd like to know that. If you have suggestions for improvement, we'd like to know that as well. Um, your responses will be used to improve future webinars. So on behalf of Smith Kettlewell, the BDRDC, and the members of the Description Leadership Network, I'd like to thank you for your attendance, and we look forward to having you join us again next time.